We've taken quite a look at what is a patient, but on the other hand, what is a disease? It turns out that a disease is a rather nuanced sort of category. The answers to this question can be either mechanistic or evolutionary. The classical categories are infectious, genetic, and degenerative diseases, but we'll see that it's not that simple. And the causation of disease varies from genetic to environmental. Those are the issues that we're going to try to concentrate on in this introduction. We'll end up seeing that genotype by environment interactions, which means basically that the way that the uh, patient responds to the, the disease depends upon the genotype of the patient, are really central. And that because they are almost a universal feature, it means that we have to concentrate on the interaction because that's where most of the action is. Okay, let's begin with mechanistic and evolutionary explanations. Nothing in biology is completely explained until you've explained it both ways. By mechanistic, we mean basically chemistry and physics, and by evolutionary, we mean all of the consequences of selection and history. So all biological phenomena have both explanations, and we can't really understand them until we've worked through it both ways. Here's an example, Crohn's disease. The mechanistic explanation of Crohn's disease is through genetics development and biochemistry. The evolutionary explanation is that it results from a mismatch of reactions to modern hygiene that leads to a perturbed microbiome and a lack of worms. In other words, it didn't used to be that way, and now we're responding inappropriately. So both kinds of explanations give us hints for how to treat the disease. They aren't uh, antagonistic, they're complementary. So let's step through some mechanistic explanations. Crohn's disease is an inflammatory bowel disease. It's caused by an immune deficiency, and the symptoms are abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, and weight loss, and the consequence can be death. There is a strong association with genetic variation in NOD receptors. NOD means nucleotide binding oligomerization domain. So these things are receptors that recognize molecules that are associated with pathogens, PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and they help to regulate innate immunity. So this is part of the crosstalk. And if there is a mutation that knocks out a receptor that's involved in normal healthy crosstalk, then essentially the immune system becomes blind to the presence of the gut bacteria, and the result is inflammatory bowel disease. Genome-wide association studies have found mutations for the genes that produce the NOD receptors, and it's been shown that a homozygote mutant for this gene has a 17-fold greater risk of Crohn's, and heterozygous mutants have 2.4-fold greater risk of Crohn's. So it's clear that there are important genetic effects. But if we look at the environmental interaction, we can see that the severity of the disease also depends on the microbiome. It is possible to give uh, cocktails of pig whipworm eggs to patients who have Crohn's disease. And in a double-blind, placebo-controlled study of 54 patients, worm egg therapy produced significant improvement in symptoms. You might want to think about what double-blind and placebo-controlled mean. This is an excellent example of mismatch. We all used to have worms. Here, this picture of Dracura suis, which is covering up some of the text, uh, is the kind of worm which is being used in the therapy. The absence of worms produces an abnormal immune response, and then the expression of the genetic effect is depending on the state of the microbiome. So all of that previous genetic information depended upon whether or not there were things like whipworm eggs that were in the microbiome. The classical categories of disease are too simple. 
It's simple enough to say that infectious disease is something which is caused by a pathogen. That's Pasteur's great insight. That genetic disease is caused by some genetic defect, and we have a large catalog of uh, important human genetic diseases. And that degenerative diseases are caused by the vulnerabilities of aging. That all sounds good, but in fact it's rather superficial because whether a patient is infected by a pathogen will depend on their genetic state and their age. So these three things interact. Some of the symptoms of infectious disease are caused by the reactions of the patient, not by the actions of the pathogen. And the diseases are interaction effects in many ways that are not captured by these categories. Genetic causation comes in different flavors. There are two kinds of genetic causation, defects and predispositions. A defect would be a fairly rare mutational catastrophe. Trisomy 18 and trisomy 21, that's where we have three copies of those chromosomes rather than two, both cause birth defects. Trisomy 18, usually so serious that the child dies in utero or shortly after birth. Trisomy 21 uh, leads to uh, developmental problems in the brain. Predispositions are different. They are usually caused by many genes. They're polygenic and they result from environmental mismatches often, not always. So they're neutral or beneficial in some setting and detrimental in another. So as an example of a case uh, where it's really a single gene defect but has an important environmental component, there is a particular genetic inability to process ethanol that seems to protect its bearers against toxins that are produced by the fungi that live in stored rice. This is found in Southeast Asia. But people who have that can't process ethanol well, and that causes unbearable hangovers. I mean, if they have a drink, they'll never take another one because it's just so agonizing. And in, in this case, we can see a clear interaction between a predisposition that's then only elicited if a new thing comes along in the environment. And the production of alcohol in evolutionary history is really quite recent. Environmental causation also comes in different flavors. There are environmental catastrophes that include attacks by predators and parasites. So contracting Ebola or rabies is a true catastrophe. The probability of death by Ebola is about 70% and by rabies is 100% if you don't get the vaccine. On the other hand, there are accumulative effects. Those include smoking, overeating, and lack of exercise. So lifestyle choices affect the risk of heart disease, cancer, and type 2 diabetes. And those have accumulative effects. Here are some catastrophes. This is a photo from the hospital in Kinshasa of case number three in the Ebola outbreak in 1976. That patient is very probably going to die, and the outbreak actually killed many of the medical personnel who were helping to take care of the patients. And here is a dog with rabies. It's clenching its mouth down on a stick. It is weeping virus out of its eyes and in its saliva. And it is highly motivated to bite other potential hosts. So the rabies virus goes into its brain and change, changes its behavior to increase its transmission probability. Those are examples of catastrophes. Here's an example of a cumulative effect, secondhand smoke. And we can see that secondhand smoke is something that's differentially encountered by different groups. So black Americans who are more than three years old encounter it about 55% of the time versus about 38% for whites. Children between three and 11 encounter it much more frequently than adults who are 20 or older. And people who are below or at poverty level encounter it much more frequently. Well, what effect does it have? Uh, here on the x-axis, we have the number of hours per week of exposure to secondhand smoke. And on the y-axis, we have the adjusted odds ratio. That is the relative risk of, in this case, peripheral arterial disease, so atherosclerosis. And what you can see is that if you get above 20 hours of exposure per week, that risk goes up quite a bit. This is a log scale. And in fact, if you're getting more than 40 hours of exposure per week, 
you are at about seven times the risk of developing peripheral arterial disease as you would be if there were no secondhand smoke in your environment. Genes interact with environmental factors to elicit disease conditions. And we've just seen some examples of that. The second kinds of genetic and environmental causation are both genotype by environment interactions. And when a cause is an interaction, it is a mistake to assign responsibility to just one component. The important effects are all tied up in the interaction. So, for example, the environmental risks of cancer, such as tobacco and air pollution, depend on the genotype. Let's take a look again at the example of variation in N-acetyltransferase and what it does to cancer risk. For bladder cancer, people who have the combination of the NAT2 slow acetylator and the NAT1 fast acetylator and are either current or ever smoked cigarettes were 2.73 times more likely to get bladder cancer. Notice that there is both an interaction between two genes and between the two genes and the environmental factor. For colorectal cancer, smoking intensity increased cancer risk among carriers of both NAT1 and NAT2 fast. So these two genes were not interacting with each other so much, but smoking interacted with both of their states. And for pancreatic cancer, NAT1 polymorphism interacts with a dietary mutagen in an intake, which actually is something that's found in barbecued meat, to increase the risk of pancreatic cancer two and a quarter to two and a half times, and it does it in men, but not in women. This is what some of those things look like. Here is a uh, ethnic minority Chinese smoking a cigar, so that's tobacco. And this is what a colon cancer looks like after it has been surgically removed. Here is some meat being barbecued at a marine cookout. And the sorts of complex organic compounds that occur in the charred and singed part of the barbecued meat are the things that raise the risk of pancreatic cancer. And this is what a liver looks like into which a pancreatic cancer has metastasized. All of these orangish blobs here are metastases from a pancreatic cancer. So to summarize, diseases have both mechanical and evolutionary explanations. Genetic causation can be either catastrophic or via predispositions. Environmental causation can either also be catastrophic or it can act through a cumulative effect. And many diseases result from G by E interactions that are missing from the classical categories. Such interactions often occur when genetic effects are polygenic and the environmental effects are accumulative.